You're listening to the all new KBLU Radio Network. That's the Blue Raven Network. Often duplicated, but never replicated. You're listening to the all new. You're listening to SOJC Radio, where truth in the Word of God is found. SOJC Radio, where you are on the fringe of your Holy Ghost encounter. Good morning and welcome to the January 15th, 2017 edition of FOJC Radio Church. I am David Carrico and for the next hour we're going to be studying the Word of God. So very glad to have each and every one of you on board this morning. We want to welcome our new listeners and welcome our old listeners. Welcome everybody this morning and our lesson this morning is 3rd Corinthians, Prophecy of the End Time Gnostic Revival. So turn in your Bibles to 3rd Corinthians and be ready to word up this morning. What? You don't have 3rd Corinthians in your Bible? Well, we're going to be talking about that this morning. We're going to be talking about this epistle and we're going to be letting you evaluate it this morning and you're going to see that I'm going to give it a big thumbs up so we're going to have a challenging lesson this morning and as we always do we want to go to prayer this morning and there are so many needs that are reflected by our listening audience and we pray so much through the week Don and I about the many requests that we get we pray with many people directly over the phone and we lift these needs up on a continual basis we've had such great victories this week we had a uh, just yesterday we had a Freemason that repented of Freemasonry and I had the honor of praying with him and praying through with about generational curses and all the various issues that go along with it. It's a great and a marvelous thing, and I believe that sometime in the near future uh, we'll bring this man on to have him give his testimony and his story. We're going to be looking forward to that. And we want to go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and we're just so thankful for all that he's doing. And let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for each and every one that's gathered together today. Lord Jesus, let us just feel the fellowship and the love of one another as we gather together as the family of God, the end-time Israel of God that will separate from this ungodly world system, the set-apart people with that set-apart Holy Spirit, that we might be that people that's pleasing unto you. Lord Jesus, we come this morning confessing our sins and our sinfulness to you, asking for your forgiveness and cleansing that we might come into your presence this morning. Feel your Holy Spirit to clear our minds of all carnality, that we might receive the Word of God in spirit and in truth this morning. And Father, we just pray, those that need a physical touch this morning, Lord, we just pray that you touch them physically. Those that need a physical touch, those that need help in areas of finance, those that need help in the area of housing. We just ask, Lord, that you move mightily in their situation. Lord Jesus, please help Donna. Help her, Lord, 
physically, give her that physical touch and quickening she needs and help her to get everything just to keep running smoothly this morning. And Lord Jesus, help me to bring forth your word in clarity and truth and humility. And Lord, help everyone anoint their ears to receive everything that comes forth this morning that's truly from you. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. And our lesson this morning is 3 Corinthians, Prophecy of the End Time Gnostic Revival. And yes, there is an epistle of 3 Corinthians. And if you would like to have one, all you have to do is call Barnes & Noble or go to Amazon.com and order a copy of 3 Corinthians. It's uh, translated by a man by the name of Ken Johnson. He is the same fellow that did the translation of the Book of Enoch that I use. And for about nine ninety five, you can have a copy of the epistle of 3 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, the scripture says, I wrote unto you, in an epistle not to company with fornicators. And what this scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians is that the Apostle Paul had already written a letter to the Corinthians before he wrote 1 Corinthians. And when you study the internal evidence of 1 and 2 Corinthians, you see that there were several letters written back and forth. And most people know that 1 and 2 Corinthians are per preserved in scripture for us but very few people know that there were several letters written back and forth and very few people know that there was an epistle of third corinthians that was considered scripture in much of the early church and that's what we're going to be taking a look at this morning and i want to read from third corinthians chapter two and i want to read the first three verses and what third corinthians is there are two chapters to it and the first chapter is a letter from the church of corinth to paul when he was in prison the second chapter of third corinthians is a letter from the apostle paul back to the corinthian church and in third corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 through 3 it says, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, to the brothers in Corinth, greeting. Since I am in prison, I am not surprised that the teachings of the evil one are quickly gaining ground. My Lord Jesus will quickly come, since he is rejected by those who falsify his words. Now, this historically is accurate. And there is nothing in the epistle of 3 Corinthians that is scripturally or historically inaccurate. And in Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31, we see the last two scriptures in the book of Acts find the apostle Paul in prison. It says, And when Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, Excuse me. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And this is the claim of Third Corinthians that at this time period, at the close of the book of Acts, this would have been about A.D. 62, that the Apostle Paul wrote and responded back to the church of Corinthians in what we're studying now the epistle of third Corinth the epistle of third Corinthians in first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 20 and 21 it says despise not prophesying prove all things hold fast that which is good that's what we're going to do this morning we are going to prove all things we're going to hold fast to that which is good we are not going to despise the prophesying that was prophesied in this letter of third corinthians now the epistle of third corinthians in history it was considered scripture in the armenian church since the earliest times and in the most popular Bible today, 
of the Armenian people, the Zohabrian Bible, it still contains the epistle of 3 Corinthians. So from the earliest times of the the church, from the first century to today, Armenian Christians have considered 3 Corinthians scripture. Also, the Syrian church, and the Armenian and the Syrian churches, these are two of the most ancient churches that arose in the in the Bible lands. And you can read in the Apostolic Fathers, Ephraim the Syrian and Arafat the Syrian, they both wrote defenses of the epistle of 3 Corinthians as scripture. So many Christians from the earliest times of the church until today have believed that 3 Corinthians is scripture. And in the 20th century, there were six Latin codices, and what a, a codice, codice is, uh, or a codex, these are Bibles that were created out of the papyri, and in just the 20th century alone, there were six Latin codexes that contained the epistle of Third Corinthians. So there is abundant evidence that not only in the Eastern Church, but in the West, many early Christians believed that Third Corinthians was Scripture. Now, it wasn't admitted into the canon because it could not be proven that the Apostle Paul wrote it. Well, I would say to them, you can't prove that he didn't. And it was, and, and I'll say this morning that I am putting 3 Corinthians back into the FOJC canon. And I can do that. And you can do that too. Because it was the church and the individual Christians that decided what books that they would read. I have no care in the world what the Council of Nicaea did, what the Council of Chalcedon did. These councils mean nothing to me because that is a part of the institution of Roman Catholicism and Constantine Christianity. And we've read and we've talked about the Book of Enoch, how that Tertullian gave a defense of the Book of Enoch and considered it scripture. And the early Christians studied and they chose what books that they considered scripture. And we don't want to get fast and loose with this, but we do want to understand that the Holy Spirit can lead us to inspired scripture. And you can read the early apostolic fathers, and some would accept some books, and some would, would accept others. And over time, it was the church and the believers that decided what books that they were going to read. And in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, I want to draw a distinction I believe that the book of Enoch and the book of 3 Corinthians are inspired scripture. And as we go into the book of 3 Corinthians this morning, you can make your decision. And in Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, And while I, while I say that the book of Enoch and the book of 3 Corinthians is inspired scripture, I must make a distinction between the inspired scripture of 3rd Corinthians in the book of Enoch, which I highly recommend both of these books. But I draw a distinction between the 66 books. And here's the reason why. In Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Bible preservation is the reason why I draw a distinction. The oldest manuscript of 3 Corinthians is in Armenian. And there are over, and let's take the book of Hebrews, just for an example, there are more than 5,600 Greek manuscripts of the book of Hebrews. There are no Greek manuscripts of 3 Corinthians the oldest is Armenian. And the same could be said of the book of Enoch. There are 
very few in comparison with the book of Enoch as with the biblical books of the New Testament. We're talking 5,000, almost 6,000 manuscripts to study of each of the New Testament books. But that does not mean that they are not inspired, that they are not scripture, and that God has not brought them back for such a time as this. And I have talked about the book of Enoch, how the book of Enoch itself claims to be a book for the last days. 3 Corinthians is very similar, because in this, I believe it is the Apostle Paul prophesying of an end-time Gnostic revival. And we're going to look at what that book has to say this morning, and it is for you, the listener this morning, to see if you get a witness of the Holy Spirit within your heart that this is indeed the word of the Lord coming forth. Now, in 3 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3, and I read this verse just a moment ago, it says, My Lord Jesus will quickly come, since he is rejected by those who falsify his words. And in this scripture, the Apostle Paul is making a statement similar to many other statements he made, that it will be in the last days before the Lord returns that there will be an apostasy. And here he gets specific. And this is what I like about 3 Corinthians. We're going to see that here the Apostle Paul spells it out even clearer than he does in any of his other epistles. And people that listen to me know that I am all about the doctrine of Christ. I believe in getting back to what Jesus said. And here the Apostle Paul in 3 Corinthians 2 and 3, he identifies this last day's apostasy as those who will falsify Jesus' words. And this hits the nail on the head so specific that nothing else can compare to it. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Here we see the Apostle Paul saying something identical to what he said in 3 Corinthians 2 and 3. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul prophesied, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There will be a revelation of the man of sin and an apostasy before the Lord returns. There are preachers that'll get on Christian television from sunup to sundown, and they'll say there are no scriptures that need to be fulfilled before the Lord returns. Well, here's one with two conditions. There will be an apostasy, and that's certainly fulfilled, and there will be the revelation of the man of sin. And we are now seeing the revelation of the plan of the man of sin. We don't know who the exact man of sin is going to be. I believe he's going to be one of the popes of Rome, but we can't say for sure. But, you know, I've said before, Pope Francis acts like he's in a I want to be the false prophet contest. He's doing everything thus far that we would expect the false prophet to do. In verse 8 here, the scripture says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And look up that word, wicked. It's the Greek 459. It's the word anomos, lawless. And if you look that up in the Strongs, it says, not subject to to the Jewish law. And the only thing I would correct Mr. Strong on that, that it's not the Jewish law, it's God's law. And we've talked a lot about this. We've talked a lot about this on Now You See TV, that there's a line being drawn right here. Where you come down on that issue will decide whether you side with the bride or whether you side with the whore. I would admonish every believer to look that word wicked up in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8, and then you better tremble in fear before God before you say that the law of God is now 
invalid. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, and we're going to see that the Apostle Paul is going to spell this out in 3 Corinthians in a way that you can't miss it. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And this teaching is one that you cannot put a happy face on. You cannot put lipstick on this pig. It's not just wrong. It is a doctrine of a devil. In Second Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul taught again about the last days. He says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unholy, unthankful, or excuse me, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And in the epistle of First Timothy in chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says something here that is identical to what he said in Third Corinthians. In Third Corinthians, he spoke of those in the last days that would falsify the words of Jesus. That's exactly what's happening now. People are lying to you about what Jesus said. They are falsifying his words, and they're saying that his words are even irrelevant and not for Christians today. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul once again is very clear. And one of the foundational teachings of dispensationalism is that the Apostle Paul taught something different than what Jesus taught. And that the Apostle Paul has a fuller revelation of God than Jesus. And I had a lady tell me not long ago, right here where we live, that the teachings of Jesus belong in the Old Testament. This is exactly the apostasy that the Apostle Paul was addressing in 3 Corinthians, and we're going to see just how specific he gets. And this is what he was addressing in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in verse 3 it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereby cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. And this is exactly what we see happening. And the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, he is also very specific about what it means to falsify Jesus' words. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul said, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last time. And if you would look the word Antichrist up in your concordance, what you would find is, the number one meaning of Antichrist means in place of. The number two meaning in the lexicon would be against. And when we think about Antichrist, we are thinking about someone that is going to come and put something in place of what Jesus taught. And what could be more Antichrist than telling Christians that you don't even have to listen to what Jesus said. You will just 
uh, that you can follow Jesus without believing his words. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying in 3 Corinthians, that people in the last days are going to falsify the words of Jesus. Now, in 3 Corinthians chapter 1, I want to read verses 9 and 10. And this is the letter that the church of Corinth wrote to the Apostle Paul when he was in prison. And there were teachers that came into Corinth while Paul was in prison in 62 AD. There, as we see, the book of Acts come to a close. And there were two men. One was Simon and one was Colobius. And scholars believe that the Simon was Simon Magnus that we read about in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. And he is considered by scholars to be the father of Gnosticism. And we'll have more on Simon Magnus possibly in another lesson. But this is what 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 3 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9 says, and this is what the church of Corinth wrote to Paul in prison concerning these false teachers that came in. And they said, what they teach is as follows. And get number one, we must not study the Old Testament prophets. This is number one on the Church of Corinth's list of what these men were teaching. We must not study the Old Testament prophets. This is at the very heart of this end-time apostasy that we are seeing right now. And I have talked so much about this, and I just have to keep talking about it, because there are so many people that need to hear and understand that this is exactly what's happening right now. This is what we are told over and over again by the so-called bright lights of American evangelical Christianity, that the Old Testament and the Old Testament law is no longer valid. And this is a exactly what the Apostle Paul addresses very specifically that these men were teaching that were coming into Corinth while Paul was in prison in 62 AD and I believe the man that was ahead of that was Simon Magnus that we hear about in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts but let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and let's look at this scripture and this is how far the American Evangelical Church has sunk into deception. And not everyone believes this, but this is the popular philosophy of the church growth movement. This is the popular philosophy of the so-called grace revolution, which is the sin revolution, of the user-friendly megachurches. This is the philosophy of the fastest-growing megachurches in America. It's overtaking the thought of American, so-called American Christianity. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not going to stop. There are just going to be bigger and better mega churches built they're going to boldly proclaim this false teaching that you know all the time if you bring up what the old testament says about sin idolatry or repentance oh that's the old testament we're in the new testament now you can just hear them repeat this over and over but in verse 14 this is what the apostle paul wrote to timothy but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now, let's just think here for a minute. The Apostle Paul is telling Timothy that from the time he was a child, he was taught the Holy Scriptures. Well, the Apostle Paul was just now writing the New Testament. The Gospels were just now beginning to circulate. When Paul is talking about Timothy being taught the Holy Scriptures from being a child, he's talking about the Old Testament 
not the New Testament, for goodness sake. Paul goes on to say here, and it's not just the Apostle Paul, it's the Holy Ghost through the Apostle Paul. But thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, this is addressing the Old Testament scriptures plus the New Testament scriptures that were then being written. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. The Old Testament is profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction. And when the, when the Apostle Paul in the Word of God says that the Old Testament is profitable for correction, that means that you can go to the Old Testament, read what it says, and correct your life by it. That it's valid for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that's the journey that we are on. We are on a journey of studying the Word of God and not just studying it from an intellectual point of view, but studying it to draw closer to our Lord. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 2, and I could read scriptures all morning about the validity of the Old Testament and about God's will being expressed through his law and through his statutes. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And how could anybody miss what our Lord Jesus says? And I am all about the doctrine of Christ. The Apostle John said in his second epistle in the ninth verse, that if any man have not the doctrine of Christ, that he doesn't have God. And how can you miss what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? beginning in verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoso shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven this is exactly what the apostle paul said that men in the last days would be falsifying the words of jesus and when you take this and you read what jesus said in the sermon on the mount in matthew chapter 5 and you say well you shouldn't read the old testament you're falsifying the words of jesus and this is exactly what the apostle paul said in the epistle of third corinthians that men would come that would falsify his words and say that we should not study the old Testament scriptures and when people listen to me sometimes they say would well, you just think that all churches are bad and I almost do uh, I'm not saying and right now there are many home churches springing up all over the world and by the way did Jesus say anything about building a church building he didn't did he did he build any buildings? Did any of the apostles say anything about building a church building? They didn't, did, did they? And it wasn't until the 4th century, after the time of Constantine, that church buildings began to be built. And I could go on all morning about that. But you see, the problem is, there is a church system that has been set up. And I know because I've been in that church system. I have been on a pastoral staff, in uh, the Church of the Nazarene, the Assembly of God, uh, Church of God of Cleveland, Tennessee, General Baptist. And I've been there and I've done that. And I've been in these pastors' meetings. And I know that you have to walk within the lines. If you're a part of any of these groups, you know what you can say and you know what you can't say. And you are a part of a system that is not governed by the Holy Spirit 
but is governed by men and is governed by politics. And in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 13, the prophet said this, For from the least of them unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Now I am sure that in Jeremiah's day, just as today, there were people there that were nice guys. They were trying to really do good. But the Bible says, when the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And you see, even if I, with the best of intentions, would try to work in that American religious system, I would have to shut my mouth and behave myself and keep that system going. That system which is in every way unbiblical. And I would have to deal falsely with my conscience before God to be a part of that. That's why it's time to come out of Babylon and serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. Now, we are going to take our break this morning, and when we come back, we are going to be opening the epistle of 3 Corinthians and digging deeper into what I believe is an inspired writing of the Apostle Paul. We'll be right back on FOJC Radio Church. You're listening to the Ali KBLE Radio Network. That's the Blue Raven Network. You're listening to FOJC Radio, where truth in the Word of God is found. FOJC Radio, where you are on the fringe of your Holy Ghost encounter. Welcome back this morning to FOJC Radio Church. And I want to say, as I always do, thank each and every one of you so much for your prayers, for your support, and all of your kindness that you show toward us. We do most humbly appreciate it. And this morning, and I might say also tonight, here at Independence Square, in Evansville, Indiana. We will be having a live service tonight, and we're going to have an apostolic communion tonight. And if you don't know what that is, just come here, and we're going to do it just like the early church did. Last time we had a meeting here, we had a communion and a foot washing, and Sister Donna is going to be uploading that service very soon to our YouTube, and also I know we're going to want to upload this to show just exactly how they worshiped God in the early church. And tonight, we are going to try to get back to that just as close as we can and to study just exactly what they did in that early church before Constantine began the age of church buildings. Now, in 3 Corinthians chapter 1, I want to read verses 9, and I want to read this whole passage for you, where the church at Corinth wrote to Paul while he was in prison, and give a laundry list, if you will, of what these two teachers came in that were teaching. They said, beginning in verse 9, what they teach is as follows, we must not study the Old Testament prophets. God is not almighty. There is no resurrection of the flesh, but only of the Spirit. Creation is not God's work. The Lord did not come in the flesh. The Lord was not born of Mary. The world was created by angels and not God. Jesus Christ was not crucified, but someone who looked like him took his place. Jesus was not of the lineage of King David. So, brother... Hurry and come here, that the church here in Corinth may remain pure 
and the foolishnesses of these men may be made known to all. Farewell in the Lord. Now, let's think about this a second item here. And we're not going to be able to go into all of them in detail. Many of them are very obvious. And the second one that is mentioned here by the Church of Corinth is that God is not almighty. Well, who in the world would say that God is not almighty? But this is being said by many in the American Evangelical Church. And what this is, this is the Masonic concept of God which I did a um, conference presentation on years ago that's really rattled around a lot. But the Masonic concept of God is that the God of the Bible is not almighty, that there are many gods and many ways to salvation. And this thought is echoed, and I remember one conference I did where a man that was a Methodist Sunday school teacher and a Freemason, he stood up and confronted me that, we could be saved through the S-U-N as well as the S-O-N. And I said, thank you, sir. You have just clarified the difference between what you believe and I believe and between what you believe and the Word of God teaches. Now, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but, my, but by me. There is one God, and there is one only begotten Son of God, the only unique Son of God that died for our salvation. There is no other way to the Father. There is no other way of salvation. Yet today, the brightest lights in American Christianity, so-called, they stumble with saying Jesus is the only way of salvation. One obvious example would be Joel Osteen on the Larry King show. When Larry King asked Joel if Muslims could be saved without Jesus, well, blah, 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 he stumbled and muttered and would not, could not say that Muslims would not be saved. I could bring forth many quotes from Billy Graham that has also extended salvation without Jesus. This is not just something that is a small thing in American Christianity. This is one of the growing things. They are extending salvation to Muslims, and this is the official position of Roman Catholicism. I could read it to you from their catechism, that Islam worships the same God as Catholics do, and they're right about that, they do. But the problem is, it's not the God of the Bible. And this idea of the many ways to salvation is coming down upon the apostate church. It's there in Catholicism, and this thought is seeping in to the daughters of Babylon, of Protestantism and Evangelicalism, that are going to unite themselves with Catholicism. And in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, the word of God is so clear. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The very simple proposition that there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism, that there is one God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that there is one Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, that died on the cross to give us salvation, this is no longer given as fact in the American evangelical church. The next thing that Paul said is creation is not God's work. And we are coming into a time where the people of God are figuring out that the scientist priest of the New World Order that they are lying to us and that they have been lying to us for a long time. We are no longer going to accept their lies and we are going to believe the word of God on evolution, on cosmology, and we are going to believe the word of God and not the scientist priests that have been lying to us. And we are just beginning to understand the full depths of the lies that these men have been teaching us. And in the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 15, 
And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the side, the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I will believe the word of God over these liars that say evolution is true. I will believe the word of God over these liars that say that we are in a heliocentric universe and that the earth is a spinning ball. I will believe the word of God. That's what me and my house are going to do. And I know that's what you are going to do this morning. We are going to make our choice for the word of God. We are not going to go along with this last day's Gnostic revival where these scientist priests will teach us lies and cause us to miss out on the deep truths of the Word of God. Now in 3 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is one of the huge battlegrounds that's going to be fought between science and scientism. The Word of God stands firmly on the side of science, but it firmly stands against the scientism and like never before, God's people are going to stand for the Word of God. And for a long time, people have figured it out about of evolution, but now into cosmology, the firmament above the heaven, the flat surface of our planet, God's people are going to stand against scientism in these last days like never before. People are going to choose to stand for the word of God and they are going to proclaim the word of God in every aspect. We are going to see people saved and set free. We're going to see Freemasons come out of the lodge. We're going to see homosexuals repent and we've had some amazing testimonies and victories in that area. We're going to see devils cast out. We're going to see a move of God of the set-apart people that want the true set-apart Holy Spirit and God is going to honor that. Now in 3 Corinthians chapter 2 I want to read beginning in verse 36. And the reason why I have fallen in love with the epistle of 3 Corinthians is it comes right out and says it. Yeah, they're going to falsify the words of Jesus. Yeah, they're going to say you shouldn't study the Old Testament prophets. And once again, in chapter 3 of the 3rd, no, excuse me, chapter 2 of 3 Corinthians, beginning in verse 36, listen to what the apostle says. And whoever abides by the rule which he received by the prophets and the Holy Gospel. Now, notice here how the Apostle Paul includes the prophets and the Holy Gospels. And this reminds me very much of what it says in the book of Revelation about those that keep the commandments of God and keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just the gospel and the New Testament, it's the prophets. Let's read it again. And whoever abides by the rule which he received by the prophets and the holy gospel. Now ask yourself this, how serious of an error is it to throw out the Old Testament? How serious of an error is it to throw out the commandments and the law of God. This is what the false prophet is going to do. This is going to cause you to side on the side of the false prophet, not the true prophet. And whoever abides by the rule which he received by the prophets and the holy gospel, he shall receive a reward, and when he has risen from the dead shall obtain eternal life, but to him that turns aside from them, there is fire with him. And those who go before him in that way, since they are men without God. A generation of vipers from these turn away in the power of the Lord. 
The Apostle John did not mince words when he said, those that do not have the doctrine of Christ do not have God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, those that don't consent to the words of Christ, he says, they are destitute of the truth. They don't have a little truth. They don't have any. They don't know nothing. In 3 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said, if you turn aside from either the prophets or the Holy Gospels. Listen to it again in 3 Corinthians 2, 37. He includes them both. But to him that turns aside from them, meaning the prophets and the Holy Gospel, but to him that turns aside from them, there is fire with him. And those who go before him in that way, since they are men without God, a generation of vipers, from these turn away in the power of the Lord. And to anybody that is in any way associating with this lie from the pit of hell, it's a doctrine of a devil, turn away from it in the power of the Lord. And many times it takes the power of the Lord to turn away from it. People really need deliverance from soul ties that they have formed with these ungodly teachers, these ungodly churches, these ungodly television programs. They literally have devils on them because these are doctrines of devils. And when you drink these doctrines of devils into your spirit, you need something cast out of you in the power of the Lord. And it takes the power of the Lord to turn away from it. And if that's what it takes... Let's do it. In the name of Jesus, repent, renounce, and cast that thing off of you and out of you. And in the name of Jesus, follow the Lord without any restriction, without any compromise, in spirit and in truth, and not in spirit and a lie. Now let's look at what Jesus said, and let's compare the doctrine of Christ with what we hear the Apostle Paul say in 3 Corinthians chapter 2. And I have just absolutely had a witness in my spirit with what I read in 3 Corinthians and with what I see the Apostle Paul say in the New Testament epistles and with what I see in the doctrine of Christ. And the Apostle Paul in 3 Corinthians he makes it all about the doctrine of Christ. Those that are going to come falsifying Jesus' words. What he said about the Old Testament. What he said about creation. What he said about all of these issues. They are falsifying his words. And the only way that we can get out from under these doctrines of devils is to come back to that faith once delivered by the saints to those precious words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as the Apostle Paul said, let's consent to them. Now, in John chapter 15, verse 6, listen to what Jesus said. We heard the Apostle Paul say in 3 Corinthians that there was fire for those that turned away from the Old Testament prophets or from the Holy Gospel. In John chapter 15, verse 6, Jesus said, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth of, as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Jesus is in perfect agreement with the Apostle Paul in 3 Corinthians that those that turn aside, they are going to get fire. In the epistle of James, in chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, Brethren, if any of you err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, in 3 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, the scripture says this, The Lord, and this again, is from the list of false teachings that the church of Corinth wrote about to the Apostle Paul when he was in prison. The first chapter of 3 Corinthians is what the 
church of Corinth wrote to Paul, and the second chapter of 3 Corinthians is what the Apostle Paul wrote back to the church. And in verse 14, it says, The Lord did not come in the flesh. The Lord did not come in the flesh. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, we are going to see this specifically identified by the Apostle John also as one of the distinguishing features of the spirit of Antichrist that would put something in place of what Jesus did and in place of what Jesus taught. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. But this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. It was within the time of the writing of the New Testament that the spirit of Antichrist was already manifesting itself. In A.D. 62, just like the Apostle John wrote in his epistle, the Apostle Paul warned in 3 Corinthians that men were going to come falsifying the words of Jesus and putting something in their place. Now let's think just a minute about what it really means to teach that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. And I believe that there are many people in evangelical Christianity, and that's becoming a big oxymoron, that would say to us, yes, I believe Jesus Christ was born of virgin. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. Yet, I believe that many of these are still denying that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 is that the deceivers, it says, many would come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And some of the biggest deceivers today are saying, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, Jesus was born of a virgin. Yes, Jesus is God. But yet they are still denying that Jesus has come in the flesh. Because when you say that Jesus is God, Jesus was born of a virgin, but yet... I don't believe we should follow what he said. I believe we can take something else and put in place of that and make it better. You are denying that Jesus Christ came to earth as the Son of God and spoke as never man spoke before. That Jesus said, every word I speak is what the Father told me. Let's read it in John chapter 14 and verse 10. Jesus said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And I would ask us all this morning, do you believe that Jesus is in the Father, and that the Father is in Jesus? If you do, you will believe that every word Jesus spoke is the words that the Father told him to speak. And if you do not believe that, you do not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You do not believe that he came to earth as the sinless Son of God that spoke every word that the Father told him to speak, that the words he spoke were not something he made up. And if you do not believe that, you do not believe that Jesus is in the Father and that the Father is in Jesus. And this is exactly what our Lord asked his apostles as he was getting ready to suffer and die and was teaching his upper room discourse. He goes on in John chapter 14 and verse 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. He will not falsify the words of Jesus as the Apostle Paul prophesied in 3 Corinthians that would happen 
before his return. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You do not believe that Jesus came in the flesh until you believe that he came in the flesh as the sinless Son of God to die on the cross for you and that every word out of his mouth was exactly what God the Father told him to speak. Markion, the Gnostic teacher, taught that there were two gods. There was one God in the Old Testament and one God in the New. And that's almost what evangelical Christians are teaching today. Yeah, the Old Testament, that's out. You know, that's out. It's just the New Testament, you see. And this isn't just a little bit of a problem. As the Apostle Paul said and the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul said it in 3 Corinthians and also in the New Testament, that to reject the words of Christ and the Old Testament that this is damnable. This is not just wrong, this is damnable. In the book of Revelation, the end time remnant of God are going to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is what is going to distinguish the set-apart remnant of God with the true set-apart spirit from the imitation apostate church, you see. The, the true remnant of God will follow both the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The apostate church will say we're following Jesus, but yet the lawless one will say that the Old Testament and the law of God has passed away, you see. There's no getting around this. This is exactly how this is coming down. It's getting very clear. And in the epistle of 3 Corinthians, the apostle Paul didn't beat around the bush, and like no other epistle in the New Testament, prophesied of this end-time Gnostic revival. He spelled it out. They're going to falsify his words. They're going to say you shouldn't study the Old Testament. Bang, bang, bang. And there's so much that we will not have time to share with you this morning. Uh, perhaps another day, we will revisit it. It would certainly be worthwhile. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. As someone that has the great honor of bringing you all the Word of God every Sunday morning, and I have the great honor to be able to share God's Word on uh, Now You See TV and other platforms that would have me come, it's not only a privilege and an honor, but it's a great responsibility because God is going to judge me by what I tell you about God. When I tell you that I believe that 3 Corinthians is inspired and that it agrees with history and with the New Testament, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't say that. I would not want to tell you to look at something like the book of Enoch or 3 Corinthians if I thought it would hurt you. But I'm telling you to that these are good because I believe it will help you. I believe it will help you see things better than ever before. And this is what the early church did. When we talk about 3 Corinthians and the book of Enoch, these were inspired scriptures that many, many Christians from the time of the earliest church until today, and as I said, even to this day, the Armenian church and the Zohabrian Bible, it still has 3 Corinthians. So, this is what the book of Ezekiel says in Ezekiel chapter 3. It's with that spirit that I tremble before God. This is why I tell you, like the Apostle Paul said in 3 Corinthians, that if you turn from the belief in the Holy Prophets and in the Holy Gospels, that you're just not going to get a lesser place in heaven. You're going to get fire, just like the Apostle Paul said in 3 Corinthians, just like Jesus said in John 15. Ezekiel chapter 3. Sorry about that. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. This is what the prophet of Ezekiel said. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning. 
nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. That's what I have to say this morning, that if you turn from the truth unto a lie, and if you turn from holiness unto sin, you are going to die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, Ezekiel said in chapter 18. In Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, not a lesser place in heaven. There are two kinds of preachers. There are preachers that tell you that when you're born again, that sin changes and that sin can no longer cause you spiritual death and damnation. And then there are those preachers that say when you're born again, that sin doesn't change, but you do. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I have to be one of the second kind, because if I do not warn people this morning, as the Apostle Paul did and Jesus did, that if you turn, you're going to get fire. God will hold me accountable. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 19, Yet if thou warn the wicked... And he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And I am going to close out this morning with Acts chapter 28. Or excuse me, Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28. And the scripture says this. And when they had heard these things, excuse me. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And it's with that heart this morning that I give this warning. It's not with a haughty spirit, but it's with a humble and broken heart that I appeal to men and women to turn to the Lord with all their heart and to enjoy the fabulous riches of His Word and of His Holy Spirit and of the great excitement and privilege that it is to serve the Lord in these last days. Let's close out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much this morning for each and every one that has studied with us this morning on FOJC Radio. I just pray, Lord, that You greatly bless each and every one of them, that You just keep us humble, keep us in Your Word, and Lord, we just want to give you the praise for everything good that happens. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Lord willing, we will see you next week on FOJC Radio Church. FOJC Radio, where you are on the fringe of your Holy Ghost encounter. You're listening to FOJC Radio, where truth in the Word of God is found. You're listening to the all new KBLU Radio Network. That's the Blue Raven Network. Often duplicated, but never replicated. You're listening to the all new KBLU Radio Network. That's the Blue Raven Network. Often duplicated, never replicated. You're listening to the all new KBLU Radio Network. Blue Raven Network. <laughs>